The year is 1297, and it's been a few months since English King Edward I defeated the Scots, with his forces winning the Battle of Dunbar and stripping Scottish King John Balliol of his kingship. Without a king, Edward has starred himself as Lord of Scotland and subjugated the Scottish nobles and people to his rule, as well as forcing English laws and taxations onto them. However, two minor nobles have rallied the people in open revolt against the English. These two men are William Wallace, a knight of Eath Lothrian, and Andrew Murray, a minor landowner. Wallace's story started when he assassinated English Sheriff William Hesselrig at Lanark. This event sparked his uprising, with Wallace's intended goal of restoring John Balliol's kingship and revenge against the English. Wallace's cause was soon boosted by the support of Lord William Douglas. With the noble backing him, Wallace soon started to gain more support and men. Within days, Wallace orchestrated a series of guerrilla campaigns around Scone, killing any English they came across. Another uprising was taking place in the north at Inverness. Andrew Murray, who was previously captured at the Battle of Dunbar, had managed to escape from his imprisonment at Chester and soon returned to his ancestral home. Once there, Beret began building his own forces, mainly from the free men around Inverness. His campaign began in earnest at the Siege of Urquhart. The initial siege was gaining momentum. However, the Countess of Ross had raised her husband's banners in favour of King Edward, as her husband, the Earl of Ross, was a prisoner of Edward's, and by showing resistance to Moray's uprising, she hoped this act of loyalty would enable her husband to be released. The arrival of this army was a setback for Moray, as after a failed night attack, Moray's own position was threatened, and to avoid a pitch engagement, he withdrew his forces. But in the coming days, more influential figures were giving their support to the rebellions. The Bishop of Glasgow gave his blessings to the cause, soon followed by Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, whose father was Lord Robert D. Bruce of Annadale. The young Robert Bruce's plan was to raise what men he could and join the rebellion. His first stop was Annadale, however, Annadale belonged to his father, and he was loyal to King Edward, plus the men there had pledged fealty to the elder Bruce, yet the younger Bruce tried to convince the men with this speech. No man hoards his own flesh and blood and hatred, and I am no exception. I must join my own people and the nation in which I was born. His speech failed to rally the men. With the rebellion gaining traction, King Edward was still dealing with matters in Europe. However, he had appointed Earl Warreen as Guardian of Scotland, as Warreen was the man who defeated the Scots at Dunbar. Meanwhile, Wallace is continuing his campaign, using the forest of Selkirk as a base of operations, whilst attacking various encampments and strongholds. However, the English have been negotiating with the Scottish Lords, as Hugh de Cressingham, an advisor to Earl Warreen, was holding negotiations at Berwick. Once the dealings were dealt with, he planned to join Earl Warreen's grandson, Henry de Percy and Robert de Clifford, in the far north of Scotland, as they were approaching Inverness to deal with the rebellious barons and lords. Percy and Clifford soon met the lords and barons at Irvine on the 7th of July, 
The Scottish nobles were shocked that an English army had come this far north into Scotland. If the English were this determined to quell the rebellion, then what chance did the nobles have of fighting back? They soon sent representatives to arrange a compromise, and with the terms sorted, the nobility bent the knee to Edward once again. This humiliating grovel by the nobles of Scotland enraged Wallace as he felt betrayed, as in his mind, the nobles only thought of their estates and not the freedom of Scotland. Wallace soon enacted his revenge by attacking the estate of one of his allies, as well as taking his allies' sons as hostages. With the Scottish nobles pacified, the English thought the rest of the rebellion would be a simple mop-up job, as they themselves were starting to struggle financially to maintain a standing army in both Scotland and in Europe. But after a fruitless chase for Moray and Wallace, the English soon had to contend with a combined force as Wallace moved north towards Dundee, which was currently being besieged by Moray. The two leaders of the rebellion finally met, and after conversing for a while, agreed to combine their forces as one united Scottish army. Earl Walreen had moved his troops from Berwick to the city of Stirling on the 10th of September 1297, and he himself resided in the castle there, but to his surprise, the army of Moray and Wallace were not far from the city, and had camped near the bank of the River Forth, not far from an old bridge crossing. This would be Moray's and Wallace's first pitched battle together, and they had chosen the most optimal position to defend, as the old bridge was incredibly narrow, and would lead into marshy terrain once crossed. Their back right flank was covered by a hill known as Abbey Crag. Yet the English were not impressed with what they saw. To them, the Scots looked nothing more than an unruly rabble that would be easily crushed under the assault by the English heavy cavalry. Yet they still offered terms to Moray and Wallace who promptly refused. After receiving the news of the refusal by Moray and Wallace, Earl Warreen in response sent some of his troops led by his grandson, Henry de Percy, away from the battlefield in an effort to reduce costs. As he arrogantly felt he didn't need any more troops to deal with the Scots. By this point, the Scots had 6,000 men on the battlefield mostly foot soldiers equipped with spears and pikes, hardly a professional army compared to the English. The English, after sending away de Percy, fielded around 8,000 to 9,000 men, a good portion being heavy cavalry, which at the time was the equivalent to a wrecking ball on the battlefield, the rest of the men being archers and men-at-arms. Warreen could have ordered a two-way assault on the Scots, as a few miles down the river was a ford used for crossing, whilst the rest of his army could have crossed the narrow bridge directly in front of the Scots' position. However, his advisers, including Cressingham, wanted to defeat the Scots as quickly as possible, in order to save time and money. Warreen agreed, and at the dawn on the 11th of September 1297, the English troops began to cross the bridge, yet after a few thousand had crossed, they were recalled as Earl Warreen had overslept. The second attempt was also recalled for some reasons that are unclear. However, after the third attempt, the battle began with Cressingham leading the cavalry across the bridge, with the infantry following behind. Once a good portion of English troops had crossed the bridge, Moray and Wallace's army charged straight towards the English, with Moray leading at the front line, with Wallace on his right flank. 
The charge by the Scots caught the English troops completely by surprise. As they were now trapped and disorganised, the English heavy cavalry could do nothing, as they had no space to reform. With their army now cut in two, English morale began to plummet. As any escape was cut off as Warren kept sending more troops two at a time over the bridge, and with the Scots cutting down each man in succession, the battle was becoming an abattoir of slaughter. In an effort to save himself and what troops he had left, he ordered the bridge to be destroyed. The English that were left on the other side of the bridge had no way of escaping, as any that tried to swim across the river soon drowned due to the weight of their armour. Earl Warren then fled the battlefield and ran back towards Berwick. The battle was over and the English lost many men, including Cressingham whose body was flayed by the Scots. This was a great victory for the Scots. However, at some point during the fighting, Murray was critically wounded and died of his wounds a few months later. With this victory, the English abandoned the majority of Scotland. Now is the time for the Scots to strike back. However, their greatest challenge would soon be upon them, as King Edward would soon return from Flanders. <laughs>